what is it that, that we're actually launching? Um, well, we're launching uh, our report uh, which says how well disabled people's rights under the United Nations Disabled People's Convention or UNCRPD uh, are being met in Scotland. The convention itself um, details explicitly the rights that disabled people have and what governments need to do to make sure that we get our rights. The UK government uh, signed up to that convention in 2009 and in doing so it agreed that the government at Westminster and the devolved governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland um, would deliver disabled people's rights as they're outlined in that convention. So our report says how well the government is doing in delivering on that promise. The report talks about both the Scottish government. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Right. Excuse me for going backwards and forwards to my computer there. Um, it talks about both the Scottish government and the UK government because they are responsible for different policy areas which affect uh, the lives of disabled people living in Scotland. And the report says what needs to be improved so that disabled people's rights are delivered effectively in Scotland. In our report, we comment on 22 of uh, the articles or rights in the convention. And although it is really difficult uh, to tell you what the priority issues in the report actually are, because everything is so important, everything impacts on disabled people's lives, and actually everything um, is quite interconnected as well. When you look through the rights, they all have an impact on each other. Um, but I'm going to tell you three things uh, in the report that I think really uh, stood out and that also seem to be concerns that we share with disabled people uh, throughout the rest of the UK. So one of those issues was that disabled people have been losing social care as funding is reduced and that the experiences of people who are receiving social care are very, very mixed depending on whereabouts in the country uh, they live. And adding into that, in the transition and um, payment, we've seen a lot of disabled people having their payments reduced or stopped. <clears throat> and so actually overall there's been a reduction in the resources that disabled people have to make sure that they can live independently and be included in the community. In the report we've also been uh, really clear that disabled people's standard of living and their health has been severely unfairly and we think avoidably impacted as a result of welfare reform policies and that has brought about circumstances which uh, threaten or in some cases end people's lives. Um, we've also noted of course that there is a departure in Scotland in terms of the approach to, to disability benefits and we're looking towards a system which really has a uh, respect and dignity at its core and we're very hopeful about uh, what that means. We talked about the accessibility of transport and housing and that that's still uh, inadequate and that's really an ongoing issue as a lot of people will be aware. Um, but to give you a flavour um, of where we are currently, um, we currently have 201,000 households in Scotland that can access essential facilities in their own home. Um, and we're seeing a lack of consultation often with, with disabled people when public spaces uh, are being designed and that leads to, to accessibility issues later on. There's also some other important issues in the convention. Um, all the issues, as I say, are important, but my uh, colleague uh, Steve will speak um, directly to, to one of the other uh, issues that we've raised that's, that's really significant. So... So why did we uh, write the report? Um, we didn't just write the report so that, that we had it. We wrote it um, to influence um, the actions which uh, the government will take in relation uh, to the issues that we've highlighted in the report. So I've mentioned that the UK government signed up to the convention in 2009. Now, when a government signs up to the convention, um, its performance in implementing that convention in its country is reviewed by a UN, a United Nations committee, every four years. Um, so, our government, um, when the government is reviewed, it's asked to uh, report on how it is uh, upholding and advancing the rights in the convention. 
and disabled people are also asked to report on how things are going so the committee won't just take the government's word for it, it will look to hear from disabled people as well about how they think the government is performing. So our government is now up for review. Um, disabled people in Scotland and throughout the UK have submitted their reports. We submitted ours at the end of January to the, to the UN committee. And the next uh, step is that the committee will meet with representatives from disabled people's organisations and human rights organisations um, throughout the UK uh, to talk about the issues that have been raised in the report. Um, so that meeting is going to happen this coming Monday at the UN uh, in Geneva in Switzerland and uh, myself and my colleague uh, Steve from People First Scotland will be at that meeting uh, representing the Scotland report. After that meeting and when the committee have heard from us, um, they'll come up with a list of issues and that list of issues um, are the issues that the committee thinks are the priorities for action for the government. So the things that they really want the government to address to better deliver disabled people's rights. Um, we expect that the committee will come up with that list by around the 20th of March. The list will then be sent to the UK government and its devolved uh, governments as well. And they'll have three months to respond to that list. At this point, disabled people can also respond to the list of issues and submit further evidence to the committee. Once the state has responded, once the government responds, um, in summer time uh, they'll attend uh, a review with the committee where they'll discuss the issues and they'll discuss further issues as well and they'll discuss their response uh, to the issues that the committee have highlighted. And the um, committee will then make recommendations uh, to the government about what it needs to do uh, to better implement disabled people's rights uh, from the convention. So. That's a little bit of a whirlwind tour uh, of the process and I, I hope it's been clear but please uh, do let me know if there's anything that you want me to, to clarify. I'll walk around the room um, all throughout the event and I'm really happy to chat to anybody who has any questions about, about that process and about the report and about um, how we're going to be using it. So just to say a little bit then about how we actually um, got to where we got to uh, with the report. So, um, we started off um, with uh, Inclusion Scotland and uh, nine uh, project partners who formed a steering group. Um, and our project partners are all listed up here and they are People First Scotland, Voices of Experience, the Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living, Glasgow Disability Alliance, the Lothian Centre for Inclusive Living, the British Deaf Association, um, the Scottish Council on Deafness, uh, Self-Directed Support Scotland and um, Professor Nicholas Watson from the University of Glasgow. And um, I'm personally very grateful uh, to everybody who uh, contributed uh, to the report through the steering group. Our uh, steering group conducted focus groups um, and consultation events with disabled people across the country. Um, they submitted evidence um, to be used in the report and they uh, looked over drafts and commented on drafts of the report as well. So it was very much uh, a joint effort. So this started off with 10 organisations in Scotland and we wrote the Scotland report. We also wrote a report um, covering Great Britain. We received funding from the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, and we partnered with uh, Disability Rights UK and Disability Wales uh, to submit a report about the, the state of human rights uh, in Scotland, England and Wales. So that report was also submitted. And now for um, attending the meeting at the UN, um, we've had to work with um, a variety of different organisations throughout the, the UK. So here's um, where we are currently. We're now working um, I've not actually counted everything up yet, but as you can see from all the locals, um, a really broad uh, range uh, of organisations, uh, including um, members of the, the Reclaiming Our Futures Alliance uh, in England and Disability Action Northern Ireland, who have also submitted a report. So we've all been working together. And that's not all, we've also um, been working um, with the, um, the independent monitoring mechanisms for the UK, so that includes the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission here, 
Um, there will also be an attendance uh, on Monday um, at the session um, with the UNCRPD committee to give their reports uh, on how, how things are um, working out in the UK and Scotland. And we've um, been fortunate enough to coordinate also with the International Disability Alliance, that's an organisation based in Geneva that helps disabled people's organisations who are attending to, to speak to the committee <coughs> to organise and to, to make um, the most effective uh, use of their time with the committee. So there's a lot of people who've been involved uh, in this process. Um, so what is significant about it? I just wanted to say um, a few things about um, what is particularly significant about having written this report and um, going to, to speak to the committee uh, in Geneva. Um, as some of you might be aware, um, it's now four months uh, since the, the UN um, committee, um, which oversees uh, the Disabled People's Convention, um, published findings into its inquiry into uh, the UK. The UK um, they launched an inquiry for um, grave and systematic violations of disabled people's human rights. So that was four months ago. The inquiry has meant that um, the review that they're about to go through, the government's about to go through, was uh, delayed. We expected that review to happen in 2015 and had prepared um, a report for that back in 2014. Um, this is actually the first time that the, um, that the committee will have reviewed a state that it's previously um, also had under inquiry. So we've got um, a little bit longer than normal with the committee. We've got double the amount of time we would um, otherwise have had. It has also meant that there are a lot of organisations interested in the process and a lot of disabled people's organisations will be in attendance uh, on Monday. And the committee have had an awful lot of evidence submitted from the UK. Um, they've had over a thousand pages uh, submitted from disabled people's organisations. So they've got a lot of information to process, a lot of voices to hear, um, so it should be a really uh, interesting meeting um, on Monday. And it's also been um, really significant because there have been a variety, as you saw from previous slides, of disabled people's organisations and human rights organisations from across the UK coordinating uh, together in advance of uh, this process to get the best outcomes for disabled people um, that we possibly can when we when we attend that meeting uh, on Monday. Um, everybody in the UK delegation is uh, really committed to advancing disabled people's rights uh, throughout the UK and so it has been um, a great pleasure uh, to work with all these organisations. Um, so just to recap a little bit on what we actually uh, hope to achieve uh, when we uh, come back after we've been to Geneva. Um, we hope that the UN uh, CRPD committee identifies the issues that are most severely impacting uh, the lives of uh, disabled people across the UK and asks the government to respond uh, to those issues. So we want to make sure that they have the right list of issues to put to our government. Um, <coughs> And although um, when the committee published uh, the, the findings of their inquiry, the response from the UK government was disappointing, uh, to say the least. Um, however, it's really important that we engage in those processes and that we um, attend these meetings and submit our reports and try to, to impact uh, the position of the, Scottish of the UK and Scottish governments. Um, it's important that the government knows uh, that we are there, that we're aware of our rights and that we're willing and able uh, to demand them. Um, and it's also a good opportunity as well um, to look at what we can do in Scotland uh, to make sure that our human rights position, uh, that we can lead the way in terms of disabled people's human rights and really have a country which has uh, dignity uh, and respect uh, at, its, at its heart. So I'm now going to hand over um, to my colleague uh, Steve Robertson <coughs> Uh, from People First Scotland and he's going to speak about his role uh, in contributing to the report and about some of the issues uh, that, that he'll be taking uh, to the committee on Monday. Hello everybody, um, as Rosalind said, I'm Steve Robertson. For those of you who don't already know me, um, I'm, a, the, I'm a director of People First uh, Scotland. People First is the disabled people's user-led organisation for adults with a learning disability in <coughs> Scotland. Um, 
I'm also the chair of the Law and Human Rights Group within People First Scotland, and that means I've had a lot of direct involvement in the development of the Shadow Report um, that we're here to launch today. So, I also sit on the UN CRPD steering group, so that's something that I was also as well. Um, and I'm delighted to say, no, delighted to be involved from the very start of the project. Um, and we have held focus groups where our members described their lived experience or experiences. And members from lots of our groups, which meet across Scotland, answer survey questions to feed into the process. So it's like information gathering. Um, about um, whether people's rights are being met or not. The day-to-day -day life of people with a land disability in Scotland includes so many different aspects. Where our human rights and our rights under the Convention are ignored. One of the main policy issues for us is that any person who is labelled as having a land disability can be subject to a guardianship order which removes their right to make decisions. And this report describes the breach of Article 12 of the Convention which exists when guardianship removes decision-making powers from an individual. also asked Scottish Government to do more to facilitate supported decision making. And we believe supporting someone to make decisions involves considerable skill and time. Time being that um, different people can take different lengths of time to um, <coughs> understand things. Um, so it shouldn't be a one cap fits all. <clears throat> there are such a range of decisions to make in life. Some can be straightforward and might happen every day, and some probably only take place once in life, but can have an impact in almost everything for your rest of your life. The continued increase in welfare guardianship, particularly for people with land disability, is of a real concern to us. Um, <coughs> as we have direct experience of former directors of our organisation having to step down from that role when the orders have been placed on them. And that's just because people, if they're under that um, order, have been deemed need to have the capacity to understand. Therefore, they kind of sit on a board. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate, but I mean, we can't do anything about that. At the moment. Continuing our partnership work with Inclusion Scotland, we will take issues from the report to the United Nations Committee in Geneva next week. <coughs> and um, as Rosalind's touched on. We will work with Inclusion Scotland and other disabled people's organisations from across Britain. For my part, I will be asking them to look in particular at the issue of guardianship that I've just mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to say it's something that we feel very strongly about. Um, so many other issues within the report also affect our members. So of course our involvement has been and is very important to us. <coughs> people for Scotland also have strong links with other people for groups across the world. Robert Martin who is a founding member of People First New Zealand, and 
Robert is the first person with a learning disability ever to be appointed to a United Nations Committee. And we have been f fortunate enough to be in contact to congratulate him and we will continue to update him on our work. We will have further contact with Robert once he has got started in his role at the committee. Unfortunately, he officially begins his work there just shortly after our trip next week. However, although we thought that would mean that we wouldn't see him, we have now found out that he may be attending the session as an observer. So that is um, true. We should have the chance to catch up with him after all, and that would be great. So today, well, let us have a think about the report. And that's me. So let's let's um, get cracking. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. It's brilliant to see such a, a wonderful turnout for this. Um, I'm Sasha from Bella Freak, which is part of the kind of creative side of Disability History Scotland. And I'm here with Alex and Stuart, who they'll talk a bit about the actual activity and how we're going to work with that. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of the technique that we're going to be using today, which is called cut-ups or cut-outs. Right. <coughs> so, in some ways, we've come full circle because cut-ups began as a technique by a group of radical artists who actually started working in Switzerland in 1915. So they began in Zurich. The report is going to be heard in Geneva, and we've kind of gone right round 180 degrees. Now, the group of artists that actually began the cut-up techniques were called the Dardarists. They were radical. Um, they wanted to protest about the, the World War I casualties, what they saw was a complete waste of people's lives, and in ways that, I suppose, help them to actually come to terms with what was going on and really kind of speak out. They began using cut-up techniques, collages, art, paintings, sculpture, any way that they could to express their horror about World War I. And <coughs> one of the paintings up here is a cut-up technique. The first one at the top is by an artist called Otto Zitz, and he produced that using cut-up techniques. It's a group of disabled people who have been injured during World War I. Underneath it is a collage, again cut-up images, of an air raid. And the Dardarists use these techniques in a way that really kind of changed the artistic landscape of Europe. Now, cut-ups really took off again in the 1950s and 1960s. This dude is William Burroughs. I mean, he's the, one of the most super cool guys from the American beat generation. And he used cut-ups with, along with his colleague Brian Gislin to produce new novels and new ways of working. They used different texts to produce new pieces of work in terms of novels, in terms of placards, in terms of just any way in which they could pr protest against what was happening in America during the early 1960s. So they were pr protesting against what was happening to black people and then with the start of the Vietnam War they started to use cut-ups to protest and have a counter culture against the American establishment. For anybody that's kind of interested in music, up here we've got David Bowie, R.E.M. and Radiohead. These are all bands that use cut-up techniques to actually come up with song lyrics. 
So anybody that likes REM particularly, if you look at their best-selling album, Automatic for the People, a lot of the songs on there are produced by them just choosing random words, random pieces of text, cutting them up and putting them together. So if you're a bit startled sometimes by what REM is saying in their lyrics, it's because they've been cut up from all different sources and put back together. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing. There's so many things going on at the moment in ways that are impacting on our lives as disabled people. This is a kind of mixed media collage where you've got somebody, it's outsider art, an image of a woman who's being sick all over the Daily Mail, which I think is a pretty good response. Um, we've got all the headlines there that we expect, scroungers, skyvers, we all know what they are. It is a war against us as disabled people. On the other hand, they're giving us the ammunition when we come to doing cut-ups to actually fire something back at them. So it's awful on the one hand, but it's a source of great art. Right? <coughs> this is a cut-up over an image, and this is the kind of thing that we're looking to actually produce today. I just really like this one. It says, this is a crazy idea, insane. It doesn't make sense. You'll do it, of course I said. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to be just like the Dardaris and be radical now. Yeah, okay, very quickly, another couple of ways to do this. Blackouts where you just have a page of text, black out everything except the words that you want to produce a completely new piece of work. Again, second image here, almost the same thing, but painted over so that you take one piece of work and just transform it into something that says what you want it to, something brand new. Again here, same things. This is scribbled out, an entire page almost, except for, I think, three words. It says, hey, mum, I'm still trying. I hope that's okay. Out of a whole page. And I think that's really powerful. Again, just words that have been taken out, just the things left that you want. And it's a really, really strong message doing that. And it, it's us taking things back and turning them into a message from disabled people. <coughs> Last of all, um, for this, um, Stuart and Alex will be explaining this. Bold is best. Nice, strong images are the ones that work in the most powerful way. This is just a black and red face and it just says, how true is this? Your body is a battleground. Well, at the moment, as disabled people, I kind of feel it is a war against us, and our, our bodies are the battleground that's being fought over. Um, and it's time for us to start fighting back. Yeah. Now, Stuart and Alex are going to explain how we're going to do this. And I have every confidence in them. <laughs> 